for joining us. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. Today I have the privilege of introducing um, Sajet Doss, who is joining us from Sydney. Um, he's an internationally respected expert in finance with over 35 years of experience. In 2014, Bloomberg nominated him as one of the 50 most influential financial thinkers in the world and number of global bestsellers. Welcome, Doss. Nice to be with you. Well, Doss, I apologize. I, I Even before we started, we, you uh, pronounced your name, and I know I just mispronounced it. That's okay. Everybody does. My full name is Shotojit Das, but the first name is a little hard for Anglo-Saxon tongues, tongues to get around. So I understand completely. If it's any consolation, all you white folk look the same to me. <laughs> yes, it is. So we're off and, off and running. Um, but could you, uh, I, I try to give a, a little brief uh, overview of some of the things you're involved with, but could you expand on your background, your involvements, and some of the books that you've written? Well, my background is I started work on the 7th of March 1977 in banking and I progressed through the Commonwealth Bank of Australia to Citibank and then to Merrill Lynch and then I worked as a treasurer of a company and I've been a consultant since 1994 and my claim to fame was in derivatives and uh, I wrote once upon a time a four volume work which was 4,200 pages. I didn't know it was going to be 4,200 pages when I started of course but it became that which somebody very kindly referred to as the sort of, uh, as the best way to put it, the Encyclopedia Britannica of derivatives. And I've also written three more popular works, which is Traders, Guns and Money, Extreme Money, and the last one, which goes under the moniker, The Age of Stagnation in North America, but a banquet of consequences in other parts of the world. The American publisher thought a banquet of consequences would probably be classified as a cookbook I tried to talk him into that because I thought it would sell better as a cook. Who was right? Well, I think uh, actually I was right. <laughs> well, I want to talk about that book spe specifically as we uh, a little later on. Uh, Das, could we uh, begin the, where where the Financial Repression Authority? What your views are on that subject? What it means to you? Concerns you might have, etc. I know you actually brought some graphs too. Well, I think the fun fundamental thing about repression is you've got to look at this crisis which started around about 2007, 2008. And the crisis relates to debt and a series of things which are debt related. And fundamentally, the way the authorities tried to deal with this was with a very old fashioned way of growth and inflation that they would grow their way out of this and they would inflate their way out of it. Now, as we know, after about eight years of this process, it hasn't really worked. Now, if that doesn't work, there's really only two choices left, and one of them is default, which of course is hugely unpalatable because people who go around talking about writing off debt seem to fail to grasp that one person's saving is another person's borrowings. So if you basically write that off, that has consequences for future consumption and future investment, and there's a huge amount of wealth loss in the world. So if you can't do that, then the only thing that's really left is what we loosely call financial repression. And financial repression really is about a way of managing excess debt. And there's a variety of ways you do it. And the most common way is by very high levels of taxation. Now, I think it's important to look at taxation because I don't think people who talk about financial repression are talking about taxation as being something that shouldn't happen. But there's obviously a point of taxation, which is to run social services and the infrastructure of government. But at a certain point, under conditions of high debt, you start to push the taxation rates up for the simple reason you use it for the state to absorb everybody's debt. In other words, socialize the debt and then try to use the taxes to pay it off. And that can be hugely unproductive for an economy. So that's one of the ways. And we're starting to see that happen around the world in different guises. We often don't call them taxes. We call them co-payments or all variety of things. But the next stage is what we call a different form of financial repression, which is to basically actually devalue the debt. And the most important way we're seeing that is obviously a period of low interest rates. And the low interest rates now, I mean, people forget that since about 2008, we've had over 600 interest rate cuts globally. Interest rates are pretty much around zero around the world. And even the long end of the curve, which is government bonds, roughly about 30% of all global government bonds are now trading at negative yields. And the whole aim here is 
either you have nominal yields which are positive but below the rate of inflation, to use that to try and reduce the purchasing power of the debt. Alternatively, as we're now finding, because inflation is low and the debt levels are so high, we've now gone to negative interest rates. And there's something perverse about negative interest rates because essentially, you know, people get very technical about it. But to me, it's very simple. You put $100 in the bank and you get less than $100 back. And this is actually a backdoor way of writing down the debt. And I think these types of policies are very, very dangerous as the market reaction to the negative interest rates in Japan and Europe have proven. And the reason is, firstly, there's no real proof that these types of policies are going to create growth or inflation. And we know why they're being put in place. They're being put in place to write down the debt. Because, for instance, if you have negative 5% interest rates, which, by the way, I don't think is inconceivable, then after 10 years, you've written off half your debt. And that's now a sort of stealth tactic that central bankers and policymakers are putting in place. And what I really dislike about this is the hypocrisy which goes into this. And everybody knows that, and Andrew Haldane, the Bank of England's chief economist, actually admitted that. He said, look, in the next crisis, we're going to have to cut interest rates. And interest rates are so low, there's no scope. And so we're going to have to go to negative territory. But we all know that if you go to negative territory, people will just take money out of the bank and just hold the cash in safe deposit boxes or wherever or under the bed. And so we're going to have to stop people actually taking out cash. And the interesting way that's being channeled by policymakers is intellectually dishonest because they're pretending this is actually necessary, banning cash is necessary to prevent criminality or terrorism, which clearly cash has a role to play. But it hasn't changed in 50 or 60 years and nobody's actually ever talked about banning cash in the 1960s or 70s or whatever. And this is very, very dangerous socially and politically because it creates all these sorts of other issues about liberty or freedom. But there are other forms of financial repression as well. And this could be just directing investment. For instance, in Spain, we know that there's a fund which actually funds government pensions. It had roughly 50% holding in Spanish government bonds. It's almost now 100% in Spanish government bonds. And the idea really is, is it's a backdoor way of funding the Spanish government, particularly during the period when their eels were under pressure. And there's a whole variety of these measures that we're starting to see come into place. And this all has to do with the fact that they're trying to use these measures to deal with the debt crisis, which I argue I would argue, is not going to be able to be dealt with, and it creates enormous social and political pressures. And whether you and I like it or not, and whatever our views are, I think what we're going to see is a period of this financial repression, which I think is very, very dangerous politically. And we're starting to see signs of this in the political extremism that's come about. And the fascinating thing about that is we've seen this week that Donald Trump has pretty much been confirmed as the Republican candidate in the United States. But at the other side, Bernie Sanders keeps sort of uh, fighting on the good fight, though it's obviously unlikely that he'll be nominated. But the most important thing to understand here is Stephen Schwartzman, the head of Blackstone at Davos, said, well, he couldn't understand why anybody would go around voting for Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And the reality is the reason these popular extreme policies are being promoted, not only in the United States, but elsewhere, is because the financial repression and the lack of honesty of dealing with the world's financial and economic problems. And that's a very dangerous social development and a political development. Um, I, uh, being in America, being in, living here in Boston area, my observation is, is the general public is voting with their middle index finger right now on both parties. Uh, in supporting Bernie or Donald Trump. It's really totally against what they see in Washington. Lack of trust, lack of confidence, lack of belief in the direction. Um, and, and they went to the, uh, into the extremes. But I don't think it's unique just in America. I think we're seeing uh, radical parties, radical views right across the world, specifically I'm thinking in, in Europe. UK, we have Jeremy Corman. In France, we have Le Pen. Uh, we have Brillo in, in, in Italy. I can keep on going. And I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying they, they a few years ago, nobody would have paid attention to them. But now they're, they're, they're major contenders for taking control. 
Well, I think uh, you're absolutely right. And the most interesting one is actually a country that you didn't mention, which is Germany. The combined vote of the two major parties used to be around 80%. It's now down to around 60%. And if you actually look at this period of history and the way the Europeans have dealt with the European debt crisis, it's almost single-handedly created parties like Syriza, Podemos in Spain, Beppe Grillo, as you were talking about, the Five Star Party. But in Germany, without these policies, alternative for Deutschmark, I beg your pardon, alternative for Deutschland would never have got any sort of traction. And obviously, some of their policies, which are anti Islamic and anti Semitic, and also really neo Nazi policies, are quite repugnant to most you know, sensible people. But the reason, and Wolfgang Schäuble, the German finance minister, has clearly said that. He said that these parties are really the creation of the economic policies that people are playing around with. And I think that's actually very dangerous. And it's setting up this confrontation, which we're seeing playing out now between Germany and the European Central Bank. And it's very, very dangerous. And I've said from day one that I didn't uh, honestly think that Donald Trump would get the nomination, but I did say at the time whether he gets it or not is not the issue. The issue is this whole movement is not going to die with Donald Trump. It's going to keep going until there is a change in the prevailing political methodology and, and frankly, the level of trust and the honesty of these people. And I see no signs of that changing. Uh, my, uh, my comment is irrelevant of this set of elections. If it's not, some things are not resolved, next elections will be with pitchforks and spears. There's that much anger very quickly building, uh, at least in, a, in, a, in America. And I, I see it in the youth, uh, the millennial generation under 32 years old, who predominantly support uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, being very much on the left wing, who are who believe strongly the system is no longer working for them. The status quo no longer offers them the American dream. And I may be being too harsh on that, but I, I get that feedback continuously. I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. So the, the game is a long one, and I honestly don't know how it's going to end, but we've seen this play out before. So I don't know how it's going to end, but in the 1920s and 1930s, when similar pressures built up, it didn't actually have a very happy ending. And I trust that it won't have the same ending this time. From an economic standpoint, these policies of financial repression and, and where they seem to be leading to cashless society, potentially NERP right around the world, helicopter money, uh, overt monetary uh, policy, um, what do you see? How do you see it unfolding? Not necessarily what you want, but how do you see it playing out over the next 12, 14 months? Any sense that way? Well, I think let's back up a stage and say, well, what was the problem? Because 2007, 2008, the best way to think about it, it was a massive set of chest pains. And there was a couple of things you could have done. One is to diagnose the disease properly, but nobody really bothered to do that. And I think fundamentally, we know what the problems are. It's debt. It's the promised entitlements we've built up in the system which are not properly funded. We know the global imbalances are unsustainable. And add on top of that the financialization of the economy where now people get rewarded for trading claims on real cash flows and real assets at a much, much higher level than actually creating those underlying uh, the revenues and the profits. It's just a completely disproportionate world. And you have financial institutions which are not only too big to fail, but too big to jail and frankly, too big to regulate and too big to manage because most of their managers don't seem to be able to control them either. So all of those we know and you leave on top of that the demographic issues which many developed countries face, the climate issues, resource scarcity, and particularly in water and food. So we've got a very toxic set of problems. Evident problems and it's almost like we're in denial or there's a lack of leadership. Well, I think it's, it's a bit of both. I think you're absolutely right. I, you know, I have a term which I refer to which is fact-resistant humans. And there's a lot of them around, and they and and they are predominantly in the political classes and the pol policymaker classes. They just completely deny fact. This will amuse you when a banquet of consequences was rewarded by of all people Stephen Ratner in the New York Times, and it wasn't a very nice review. It killed the book in North America. But the most important thing was he just couldn't handle a blizzard of facts. He said there was just too many facts in this book. And you know, one of the most interesting things is an American writer called uh, Fl uh, Fran O'Connor who said. You know, facts really don't depend on your ability to stomach them. And, you know, it, it's just, they're just there. And, you know, you, you can actually 
sort of deny reality, but you can't deny the consequences of reality. And to some extent, those things are now coming home to roost. And I think the way this is going to play out is in one of three scenarios. The one is what I jokingly refer to as the Lazarus economy. And this is where, you know, all the skeptics, and I'm obviously one of them, are wrong. And everything goes back to the status quo ex ante, and everything goes back to normal. Now, I don't think that's likely. But, you know, you can never tell. It might be, you know, a half a percent chance, but there is a chance. I mean, if somebody comes up with a source of very clean, cheap energy or, you know, for instance, intergalactic life, of, you know, appears willing to trade with Earth with something that we have that they want, all of the dynamics would change. But I don't think it's a likely scenario. It's certainly not a bankable scenario is the way I would describe it. The most likely one is a period of stagnation. And I give that about a 70% chance. And this is really turning Japanese. So what happens is we are stuck in this environment of very low growth, disinflation, you know, deflation type of environment. The debt keeps building up. We use policies like financial repression, low interest rates being the predominant way of trying to stretch this problem out as for as long as we possibly can. And the one lesson from Japan that I've learned is that you can do this for a very, very long period of time. And I think one of the inf infinite abilities that policymakers have is to deny the truth and to keep the game going. And they're going to try and do that for as long as possible. But the problem is that's not sustainable for, you know, ever. And the last scenario is the one which I think is almost inevitable now, which is the 30% scenario, which is the crash. And the only question that you're really looking at is whether that happens suddenly or we get poorer gradually and eventually the system breaks down. And the triggers for a crash are just so beautifully now set up because you have massive overvaluation under the influence of very, very cheap and abundant money. You have basically debt levels which are unsustainably high and you have all these nodes of instability going on and it's all held together by chicken wire which is basically by a bunch of central banks pumping more and more money in and coming up with more and more far-fetched and less effective schemes. And the crucial thing I think that people forget is this is the ultimate act of faith going on. And the most amusing thing about it is the central bankers who completely misread things in the lead up to 2007, and everybody knows they actually were contributors to the crisis, have suddenly became after that, and I was really puzzled, the saviors. I mean, I always loved the cover of The Atlantic with Ben Bernanke as the savior. And, you know, it's like the arsonist after the event being actually praised as a person who came and saved the world by turning on the fire hoses. It was kind of crazy. And so at some point in time, if the thing turns and people say, oh dear, you know, the emperor has no clothes. These people don't know what they're doing. It'll actually trigger a very, very major correction. And the problem this time around people need to keep in the back of their minds is it'll be very different to 2007, 2008. Firstly, the problem is much bigger because we didn't deal with the crisis. The second is emerging markets, which were a source of strength in 2008 in two ways. They provided demand for weak, advanced economies, but also their abundant savings helped cushion many of the problems in the West. Well, they're now the source of instability in many respects, not the actual source of strength. The third thing, which is what we were talking about, is the fact that the policy weapons are all gone because interest rates are at record lows, fiscal flexibility is very limited around the world. And these policies don't work. They don't create growth and inflation. So it becomes much, much more dangerous now because those supports aren't there. And the last issue is the social and political tensions. Geopolitically, we're in a much worse place than we were in 2007, 2008. And socially, the tensions are starting to build up. As you were pointing out, the pitchforks are not far from coming out. And under those conditions, whatever happens now, will be far, far more difficult to control than they were in 2007, 2008. And I think, essentially, we are at a very, very dangerous inflection point. And really, the choice is between, do we stretch it out over a period of time so that we can def keep deferring this day of reckoning, or it suddenly comes upon us? And the one thing I do know, which is Stein's law in economics, is if something cannot go on, it won't go on. And when it happens, 
it happens very suddenly. And I hear people saying, oh, no, 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 the central banks have this under control. And I'm going, yes, they have that under control for the moment. But in complex systems, they tip over extremely suddenly and extremely quickly. And none of us, and I'm certainly not pretending I know what that trigger will be, but there will be a trigger and then we can look back on it and say, well, that was obvious that was going to be the trigger, but it's not in, adv- and in, in advance. And the problem is, if you look at it, what exacerbates this is everybody now is in crowded trades, chasing risky assets, because that's the only way they can actually feed themselves. It's a very dangerous situation we've set up. And I, I actually, um, for the first time in my life in financial markets, I look around and I'm actually fearful. Because when this goes, it's not going to be pleasant. And this time around, it's going to be much, much more difficult to control than it was around the Lehman's moment. Those who went through a bankruptcy often say, and a couple of well-known people have said it, I went, I went broke slowly, then suddenly. And an event triggers it. And I've watched personally, you know, 2008 was a financial crisis leading into really global economics crisis and now it's moving into a political crisis and each of those are a much more serious event much more broad based and and it's clearly now global whereas 2008 though it affected globally it was US centric this and therefore the level of complexity of a problem or a break is much more difficult to fix if at all can be fixed with uh, with agreements this is a little frightening I'm sure to many of our listeners does what should investors do? I'm not looking for investment advice, but what kind of things directionally can they do to prepare themselves? Well, I think the best way to approach this is you have to think about investment in terms of what are you looking in terms of as the outcome. And I start with a rule of three. And the first rule is return of capital. Will Rogers, the American comedian, used to say, it's not the return on my capital, it's the return off my capital that I worry about. That's pretty sage advice. The second thing you look for is income. And the final thing you look for is capital gain. Now, in this crazy world from the 1980s onwards, we sort of reversed the priority. It was sort of capital gain first, income next, and security of capital last because you know you know and one of the most interesting things is that phrase stocks for the long run was the idea was that no matter what happened how much it fell at a given moment in time if you held it long enough you'd get it back get back the value i don't think it's going to be like that necessarily going forward so i think you have to think about effectively how you secure your capital rather than worrying about the capital gain or the income And to some extent, one of the key things is to find those streams of things that people need. And, you know, people are going to need to eat. People are going to need gasoline to fire up their cars or whatever. And and I've always said the three things I always liked was food, oil, and gas, though obviously the oil price hasn't done very well. But I think that's short-term technical factors rather than long-term factors. And I would put in there other sort of scarce resources like water and all of those types of things. And the final one is guns, which is kind of paradoxical for somebody who lives in Australia where you're not allowed to have guns. But the thing is, it's a general term for me for defense. Because in a world which gets increasingly insecure, then obviously there will be a premium on things which provide security. And I'll give you a very good example. I used to do a lot of work in South Africa. And one of the the best industries there was security. And in fact, if you look at their technology, a lot of the technology that is now going on in the rest of the world is actually coming from places like South Africa and Israel, which are just perennially insecure securities where they invested a lot in that. So you have to look at, firstly, capital security, a bit of income, Don't worry about the capital gain if it comes, if it doesn't come. And you're looking for areas which are absolutely crucial in terms of the actual needs of ordinary people, and that will be protected. And ultimately, also, you need to match the currencies, because one of the things in this world that's going on is massive currency wars, which means currency instability is going to be one of the features of financial markets for a very long time to come. And in that sort of world, you have to match your assets and liabilities. And if you consume in US dollars, having assets in US dollars makes a lot of sense. You don't want to play around with that. And it's a very, very difficult sort of environment. And the problem for everybody is that, for instance, the asset class I actually love now is volatility. 
simply because it's just melt ups and melt downs. I don't really worry about direction. It's just pure volatility plays. And that's very hard for ordinary investors to do. It's not something that you can do very easily. And this is where the policies, to my mind, are hugely repressive because what they're doing is forcing people to take risks with their savings, which in my view, they should never be forced to do. But not only that, they're actually not being given access to products which actually can deal with that because of their complexity factor. And all that's happening, intentionally, they're going to go broke or get poorer over time. And this is the tragedy of this period. And I'm absolutely astonished when you mentioned pitchforks earlier, that investors haven't picked up their pitchforks and gone after some of these policymakers. Though, give it time, I suspect that's going to happen. Yeah, there's a lethargy in, in, in the United States. It's, it's un, untypical of the country. Uh, usually it's uh, standing up and really uh, pushing back very hard. And I it just said it's building because there's a there's a cracking in the feeling of patriotism is what I'm sensing, and it's a incredibly strong strong patriotism in America. And it's not a disrespect for the country; it's the leadership. And I'm not being political here and in those statements. Das, we have just a brief period of time left here. I I'd like to hear your views on China because I know you've written extensively. You're very knowledgeable in this area. Can you can you give your share those views with us? Yes, I think China is very interesting. And I think the basic problem with China is there's a pre-2008 period and a post-2008 period. And I think the pre-2008 period was fairly sound emerging market economics of building out industry and so forth. But in 2008, when there was a synchronized global recession, China was hurt very badly. And I remember there were 20 million people who became unemployed in Guangzhou province alone, literally overnight. And the Chinese Politburo placed a great deal of emphasis on social stability. And unemployment and social stability are not compatible. And so they launched a program which has been going on since 2008, which is basically debt-fueled. And it's debt-fueled investment. And the real purpose of this is to basically create employment opportunities and to allow people to have some improvement in their living standards and have work. Now, what that's done is Effectively, if you look at the amount of debt in China, in 2000, the amount of debt was $2 trillion. In 2007, it went to 2000, I beg pardon, in 2007, it was uh, $7 trillion. In 2014, it's $28 trillion. I repeat, $28 trillion. So it's gone up by a factor of 14 times in 14 years. Now, as a percentage of GDP, obviously, it's slightly different. But it's basically doubled as a percentage of GDP, roughly, since about 2007. And You can't have that type of growth in leverage, in debt in a financial system, without consequences. And that would be okay if they'd invested wisely. But if you actually look at where the money has gone, it's there's massive overcapacity in many industries. There's a lot of real estate, which is about 15 to 20% of GDP of of China is tied up in real estate. A lot of that's actually not being used. And I think it's almost inevitable that they're going to have some problems. Now, the question is, how are they going to deal with the problem? Now, the Chinese way of dealing with the problem is pretty straightforward, and I saw this. And everybody thinks this is a new crisis in China. It's not. It's basically a crisis, which is this is the third or fourth debt crisis or banking crisis I'll be involved in in China in some shape or form. And the last time around, what they did, and the previous times, is the state stepped in, created asset management companies, bought these bad loans from the banks, slapped a government guarantee on some bonds, sold it back to the same uh, banks. And then they allowed time to take care of the problem. And to give you some idea, the last time around, which was around 2000, the bad debts in China were about 20% of GDP. Ten years later, because of the growth in GDP, it had gone from being 20% to about 4%. And that allowed them to deal with the problem. The problem is now that the debt, and the bad debt problem is much larger, and they're not going to get the GDP growth that they have. So they're going to have to try to deal with this. And the way they're trying to deal with this is by keeping deposit rates low, keeping the system very liquid, allowing the banks to have large profit margins so they can gradually absorb these losses. But I don't think they have the flexibility. And the problem now is, as the Chinese economy slows, they've panicked again. And we've seen since the end of last year and the first half of this year, the state push out more money. So they're just trying to actually keep growth up. But in doing that, they're making the basic problem worse. And there's a lot of mythology in China about 
the advantages of a command economy in the sense that they can push down things. That's true up to a point. But my dealings with Chinese authorities is I think people overestimate their financial acumen. And the second thing is they also overestimate the ability of the center to control what is a huge landmass and a very disparate landmass. So I worry about policy mistakes and not being able to enforce that. And I think the best case is that China becomes like Japan, which is stuck with all these bad debts on their balance sheet and gradually slowing down, turning Japanese like the rest of the world. But the problem is if they miscalculate or the problem is bigger or comes upon them in a way that is much quicker, that you could potentially get a banking meltdown. And the problem with that is it'll f- spread from China out very quickly because there's about a trillion dollars of exposure that foreign lenders have to Chinese banks and Chinese companies, which is very substantial, and it's dollar exposure. And if obviously the Chinese renminbi or yuan devalues, that makes servicing the debt even harder. So I think it's a very interesting phase, and I think it's going to be very difficult for them to manage. And that's going to be one of the sources of instability in the world, which we'll have to grapple with. Another source of instability that we have. Of course, you have. <laughs> We've got quite. We went through quite a few. Das, we're up against our hard line. We're going to have to end. Uh, could you? Uh, great discussion. There's so many more questions. I I have to have you back and, and expand on more of these. But could you tell our listeners how they could follow your writings, your work, and your books? Well, the strange thing is, I have actually nothing to sell, and basically, I don't really do much work anymore. But if they want to read what I write and so forth, there are a couple of sources. I've done a number of books, as you mentioned. The latest one, A Banker to Consequences, discusses some of these issues in some detail. And I write a column still for The Independent in the UK called Dust Capital, which is free online. And I write the occasional piece for Market Watch. So if they're desperate to hear my broodings uh, in this very, very busy world, they certainly can follow me there. Well, I know your work is regularly all around the world. I, I come across it quite regularly. So whether you're trying to put it out there, everybody seems to be desperate to hear it. So I can I compliment you on that. Das, thank you very much for taking the time. Appreciate it. I know it's late in Sydney, so I'm going to let you go. It's my great pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me.